So we are in 11 honors, and we're talking about Matthew 4, and before we get to the poetry, but um, I really encourage you to be, a, to be doing something like that. And this verse, it was just a little verse, um, but to me, it spoke of that in a way that I wanted to share with you. Um, if you're interested, I have a, uh, on the, the corner here, a Bible reading plan that you could read about three verses a day for a year and read the whole Bible through. Why would you want to do that? Well, I think this verse speaks to that. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be that plan or even reading it through, but look what Jesus said during his temptation. It's the first temptation, if you recall. Do you remember what it was about? Do you remember the first, the, the first of the three temptations? Anybody remember what he was tempted to do? Satan came before him. He, 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 had, he was hungry because he'd been out there for 40 days without eating. And so he was weak. And so Satan comes to him and says, Turn, if, if you were the Son of God, which is significant because the last thing that was said in the previous chapter at his baptism, God spoke to everybody who was listening after Jesus came out of the water and the, the voice from heaven, the Father, said, uh, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So the last thing that Jesus heard from the Father in that moment was that he was the Father's beloved Son. He was the Son of God. So the very next chapter that he deals with uh, Satan's temptation. And what does Satan do in the three temptations? Two of them, he says, if you are the Son of God. So giving some doubt to Jesus, trying to... Uh, tempt Jesus. It's a real temptation. It's not phony. Now, he is God, but he's also a man. So, was there a possibility that Jesus would have failed? I don't know. Not as God, but as man. Um, he, he, anyway, we call it a test for a reason. You know, you, you have to take the test before they can give you the grade. They don't give you a hundred before you take it. So, Jesus had to go through this test. And the first thing Satan does is, is question whether he is the Son of God. And to me, that is so important because if you think about the, the uh, Garden of Eden, what does Satan say or the snake say to Eve? You remember some of the things he says to her? To tempt her to disobey the word of God? She said that we cannot eat of the, the, the tree. We can eat everything else but that one tree. We can't even touch it, which is not what he said. And if we do, we'll die. And Satan looked at her, I picture he looked at her, as the snake and said, did he really mean you would die? Do you think he really meant that? See, it's the same thing. God's going to come after your faith, I think, through your understanding and belief in the Word of God. It's not going to come, it's not some idea out there. It's going to be through the Word of God. That's how he's going to challenge your faith. And if you don't have a strong belief in the word of God or know it then uh, it, it, all he has to do is it, you just don't want you don't believe the Bible anymore well then that's all he has to do You're, because you cannot relate to God without it, without his word and notice what happens here Jesus answered to the stone thing and the bread thing he says it is written it is written isn't that interesting he didn't say God said he didn't say remember Jesus himself is the author of scripture and Jesus' response to Satan was not to argue with him not to get on a philosophical even theological discussion with him Jesus the author of the word of God simply quotes himself it is written so he wrote it right it's, it's, um, it's, it's the word of God and so he says it is written so that's your answer to Satan to me is it is written and if you know what's written you can respond to anything Satan does and I think people that are going to try to ruin your faith are going to go after the word of God your understanding and your belief in it and notice Jesus hadn't taken that he says no it is written he uses the word of God against um, the adversary of God which is Satan man shall not live by bread alone and we pointed out that word alone was, was significant because you can you live without bread no bread meaning food no you can't but if that's all you do live according to bread then you cannot really live 
you're not going to really live just by satisfying your physical, earthly, worldly needs. You're not really living at all. Jesus said you can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, by the word of God. And he doesn't say by the book of Romans, maybe Matthew, maybe Revelation, uh, maybe Proverbs, Psalms. You, you read those five books in your life, you're good to go. Uh, there, there are 61 other books in the Bible. And Jesus alludes to that by saying every word. That's why I really encourage you to read the Bible through. Because you're never going to read the book of Zechariah or Haggai or uh, Joel or uh, Habakkuk, did I say that, or Malachi. Maybe you'll never read Philemon or 3 Peter. Um, uh, you're probably not going to read Hebrews because that's kind of a long, long book. You won't read those books unless you determine or will yourself to read them. And the best way to read them is just, in my book, for me anyway, start at the beginning and work your way to the end. Um, I start on January 1st. I read three chapters, one from Matthew, two from, in this particular uh, plan, two from Genesis. Um, the, the, the New Year's Eve, at 9.30 in the morning, I read the last uh, I read the last 10 chapters of Revelation. And I had finished reading the Bible for the year. And one of the reasons I do it is so I can stand up in here and ask you to do it. If I didn't do it and can't do it, I couldn't ask you to do it. Now, if I'm a coach and I ask you to run, um, you know, a sub-25K, 20 5K, um, I, I can't do that. I can't even get under 30 minutes anymore for 5K. Uh, that's different, but it's not different with the Word of God. I wouldn't want to ask you to read it if I'm not personally reading it. And I'm just telling you, it'll change your life. I'm also telling you that you won't read it unless God encourages you to read it. If you do read it, my belief is because God encourages you to read it. I think it's, it's, it's unnatural to read the Bible. Why would you want to read the Bible if you're not a believer? I mean, I guess it's possible to read it, you know, to study it if you're, you know, I don't know, if you're just an academic thing. Um, of course, we're not talking about doing it that way. So I think if, if you decide at some point to read the Bible regularly, that'll be because God put it on your heart. And until he puts it on your heart, you won't want to do it. And the moment that you want to do it, you'll realize it was God who put that in your heart. I truly believe that. That's why I became saved. I don't know how, if you remember how you were saved or when you were saved. My wife doesn't. And she's saved. She's as saved as I am. She doesn't remember the day she was saved. She remembers the day she was baptized. But, um, you know, he puts it on our, I know he put it on my heart to ask Jesus to save me. I didn't, I didn't do it naturally. I was the last thing on my mind was Jesus when I went to Carolina in 1970. So the only reason I started thinking about Jesus because Jesus put it on my heart to think about it. And I said, Lord, I want I want to be saved. And I think it's true with the Bible. So I really encourage you, they're going to sit over there the rest of the year. You can take it or leave it. I know I'm going to read it because that's just God's call to me is to, to do it, to keep reading and to keep learning from it. Uh, but I just, I just thought this really uh, spoke to that really well. So what I like to do um, I think we finished all the notes. I don't think I have this, but if you don't mind checking to see if you have it, it's a packet, and I don't think it is, but it says, Selected Poem Family Dickinson. It's got a short poem followed by a longer poem. Um, okay, well, I, I didn't think so. I got plenty of them here. If you do, you get the back. So you know a little bit about Emily Dickinson. We've done Whitman. Whitman and Dickinson are kind of a unit because they lived about the same time. They're both Americans. They both, though they never knew each other that I know of, they both changed poetry in America. They were people that 
in the 20th century, people were reading and being influenced by them, not just people at their time. So they are very important to American literature, and that's why we do them. Plus, it's, it's in keeping with the time period. We're reading uh, a Civil War book, Civil War era book, uh, Huck Finn, and the next one we read, Red Badge, will be a Civil War book. You're, you're getting close to the Civil War, I'm sure, in your literature. So all this is kind of driven by the chronology of it. Uh, I think we did this first one, but we're going to do it again. It's just, just a review of talk. Um, well, all of, her, all of her poems are entitled by the first line. So that tells me that she didn't give her poems titles, most of them. And some editor, and that's what editors do, they'll take a poem that's got a number or something else, and they'll give it a title by the first line, right? So that's why you see that with Emily Dickinson. This one is called There Is No Frigate Like a Book. And I think we did it, but it's not, it's, we'll do it now, but if we did, just uh, put up with it for a minute. Um, are there any questions for us? Yeah, there is. Okay. So we'll just kind of review those. Um, would you mind reading that? Just the short poem at the top of the page. There is no frigate like a book. And it's frigate. A frigate is a ship. A there is ship. no frigate like a book. A naval, naval ship. To take us lands away. Or any corset like a page of passing poetry. This traverse made the poor escape without a press of toll. How frugal is the chariot that bears a human soul. All right, it's really short and sweet. Um, let's take a look at the questions um, there on the last page. Uh, I don't know if you have access to a dictionary, but I'll kind of give you these. A frigate is a naval vessel. The Coast Guard uses frigates. I don't know what, guys, I don't know what constitutes a frigate. I'm not a naval person or a sea, you know, sailing person. But um, I don't think it's a huge vessel. Um, a quarry or courser, courser is a war horse. So um, you've got frigates and war horses. Um, and I guess the first question is, what does she mean? in this poem. That's always what you're trying to figure out. What is the meaning of the poem? Um, question number one says, why do you think Dickinson uses those terms to describe a book and a page? So, um, why does she use a frigate to, why does she describe a frigate as a book and vice versa? There's no frigate like a book. A book is described in terms of this naval vessel. Why do you think that is? What do those two have in common? In fact, what do they all have in common? What do coursers have in common with a page of poetry? So what does a frigate have in common with a book and a courser have in common with poetry? Yes? Uh, well, so I just quickly looked up the def what defines a frigate. Yeah, good. So uh, three different definitions from Merriam-Webster. A light boat propelled by oars but led later by sails a square rigged war vessel intermediate between a corvette and a ship Arnold and a ship of the line. Corvette. Yeah, that's what they were that's what they were called. They're called corvettes. They were the original corvettes. And three, a modern warship that is smaller than a destroyer. So I guess it would be fair to say it's not a huge battleship size vessel or cruiser. It's an in, in, intermediate size. I was gonna say Coast Guard uses frigates. Navy uses them. My dad served on Okay, and so the Coast, Guard, the Coast Guard doesn't use big battleships, because um, that helps remember. What did he do on, on uh, I can't remember what he did on the frigate, but he also worked on an air, he uh, served on an aircraft carrier. CBN 73, he was the USS George Washington. Oh, he wow. managed the nuclear reactors on um, the two nuclear reactors on the aircraft carrier. Um, well, that's very interesting. I had a, uh, I never met him that I know of. I had a cousin, I guess, who served on the USS, um, uh, what, is, what was it called? The, uh, was it, I think it was the Enterprise, like the, you know, the Star Wars thing, but this is before Star Wars. 
I think that was the name of it. It, it, it was the first nuclear, I don't think it was Enterprise. It was the first nuclear submarine to go under the North Pole. Anyway, when you said nuclear, that's, uh, I mean, you know, there's certainly always danger with that. All right, so the question still remains. Well, how is a frigate, a naval ship, like a book, and how is a courser like a page of poetry, or vice versa? It's really the vice versa. How is poetry like these two? What do they have in common? What does a frigate and a courser, Ryan, have in common? A courser is a war horse. Uh, and a frigate is like a boat? A naval vessel. Fight, F I G A C. What else? What else do ships and horses have in common? Yes. They're a means of transportation. Transportation. And that idea is carried even in the very last um, image where it says, How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? So you got chariot, you got courser, and you got frigate. All means of transportation. Um, so question one says, why do you think he uses those terms to describe a book in France and poetry? One is that they, they are means of transportation, but still that's, I still have a problem with it. What does transportation have to do with poetry? Yes? Um, when you're reading poetry, it puts you in a sense of uh, adventureness and ex in exploring, just like, just like a bay is written. Go ahead. Just like a uh, big ship would do, where you're transporting, you're adventuring off to a different place. And see, so cherry in there. Uh -huh. That would that would do the same thing. They all happen to be really good points, as Brian said. Fighting, they're fighting. Um, one a chair is not a vessel, a horse is not a vessel, but fighting transportation. And they they have to do with war, but they also have to do with transportation. What about the fighting? I wonder why poetry, which I don't associate most poetry with war. Um, well, how is poetry, I wonder why he, he uses the fighting angle, the war angle. I'm not sure I can answer that. I've never thought of the question before. But well, they have that in common. Yeah, what do you think? Um, I guess for like romanticism um, or realism or stuff like that, they, they could sort of be fighting because one's just bad veteran, but glorifying nature, and uh, whereas, yeah, I think it's realism, and basically just saying, yeah, nature's not all that great, and sort of like modern things. Well, I think you're absolutely right to use the term, um, to use the term romantic, because they all, each one of those has romantic ideas associated with it. Uh, uh, because they're not normal. They're not normal ships. They're not rowboats. They're not um, uh, uh, donkeys. They're not uh, workhorses, and they're not wagons. Those are those would be things that are associated with war. And so I think I think you're right. The war angle probably makes it more romantic. Um, of course, they they are all. Uh, what do you call it? Was the word lichen? Is what do you call that kind of comparison? Uh, like a book, like a page. Oh, uh, analogy. Uh, that's a. That's not specifically what that is. Oh, it's a simile. It's a simile. Uh, simile. So just it's important to call it what it is. Um, okay, so we've got two of those, which we've explained that. Um, it said, "What is the tone of the form? How is it achieved?" What is the central theme or idea of the poem? Um, I guess the question I would ask is, um, okay, here, here it is. Um, how are those forms of transportation, well, let's, let me rephrase that. How is poetry a better form of transportation than Frigates, coursers, and chariots. In some, it's it's superior in some way. You you mentioned that you can travel in literature, like you can travel on a form of transportation. But she's making the point that they're actually 
the poetry is actually superior in what way? Well, I guess the frigates and corsairs like physically transporting you to a destination, but maybe poetry is like transporting you in a like mental way to more I guess like knowledge or something. Like it gets you to a to a destination. Well, well before we go uh, to Tucker, it says Look at the end, he says, How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? Uh, Hartley, what does that mean where it says, How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? He's saying that that poetry can transport, can't transport you physically, but what does it transport? Mentally. That's what he's saying, but what does it mean by the human soul? Um, like talking about mentally. What? Um, you got the intellect, right? You got the body, and then you got the spirit. And so, which of those things do you think would probably be? Thoreau would agree with this. Would probably agree, would be the most important of those three things: the body, the mind, or the spirit. What do you think? Spirit. Well, one reason you could say that is because the spirit is immoral. Okay, I mean. You're going to live somewhere the rest of your life. I mean, afterlife, you're going to be either hell or heaven. So the spirit is immortal. So she's saying, is, is um, Jeff was saying, that literature is actually superior because it transports not just the intellect, but it transports the soul. There's some way you could make the argument that it, it does more than just teach you a lesson mentally. It actually lifts you up spiritually. Um, I like this question oh here's another way in which poetry is superior than frigates coursers and chariots it's cheaper it's cheap. very good where does it say that uh, where it says this traverse may the forest take that's great I didn't, I didn't know if anybody would pick up on that it's, it's cheaper you can't, you can't it, no one would have at this time have money to buy a chariot. By the way, what what does, what era, E-R-A, does a chariot make you think of? Romans. What era maybe does a courser make you think of? Yeah, I think some ways it might be the Middle Ages because you, know, you had war horses and, and remember um, Song of Roland? Um, and a frigate was something, I don't know what comes to your mind there, but yeah. Uh, what was this, Emily Dickinson that wrote this? That's right. Uh, one thing I would have to disagree about is Boris Sackville, how she says what, uh, poetry is, more, is like, uh, greater than the, what we were talking about earlier. earlier. Yeah. Um, poetry is it's superior. But she does say there's no frigate like a book. The book is, is, there's no frigate as good as a book, is I think what she's saying. But you're disagreeing with her. Go ahead. Uh, because, like, that's whenever you're reading poetry or a book, it's like imagining that thing. But when you're actually on the chariot or horses, you're actually doing the. That's a good point. Yeah, Emma. Um, I noticed that the things, the. Really good, also. Very good point. Yeah, um, you're right. They don't literally carry your body, but then I think she's arguing that the soul is more important than the body. So anything that just carries your body, a trailways bus, a Greyhound bus, uh, you know, you're no better person having made the journey. True. You know, but I think she's just arguing that you might be a better person through the literature. So very good point. But I really love that idea. That the limitation of it. Uh, can I also argue something no uh, no form of transportation can do? It can take you through time. We just mentioned chariots, the Romans. We mentioned coursers, maybe the Middle Ages, whatever frigates, right? So so not only is Emma says or or poetry able to carry you through time, 
I mean, through distance, but it also carries you through time. You see, both time and distance can be overcome by poetry. And frankly, that's one reason I, I love to read because I can go places. I can go anywhere in the world you know, in an airplane, I guess. You can fly anywhere. But you can't go back in time except through poetry or, or literature. Or history too. I mean, she's talking about literature. It applies to any kind of history of literature. Um, so uh, we just did three. Uh, what is the tone? Tone meaning the kind of the feeling of the book, of the poem. How would you describe the tone? Yeah. Very good. I like that. That's another thing, the size differential you know, between a small book, a word on a page, a page in a book is small versus frigates or huge uh, sailing ships, I mean, warships. Uh, and I think you would say it's kind of uplifting. It's kind of noble. It's not trivial. It's not funny. It's not sad. If anything, it's more inspiring. So I think you could say that about the. And this says the central theme or idea. I don't want to, I just want to make sure we get this. I think we agree that it would be the superiority um, of literature to forms of transportation. That, that's, that's what her comparison is. Transportation physically versus poetry. And that literature uh, is superior to that. Well, good job. Now, the next one I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to do it. We did that together. It's, it's a good way to do it. This is called... Uh, because I could not stop for death. And so there are questions on the same page. I'm going to ask you to work on if you want to ask your neighbor to help you, that's fine. But I will give you credit for this when we're done. Um, uh, Julia, do you mind reading? Because I could not stop for death. Because I could not stop for death, the timely stop for grief. The parents that tell us to us ourselves and immortality. We slowly grow. So I'm going to let you answer those. Um, I think I have a definition here of the, the first one. Let me let me find that. I have it written down. So the first one you can kind of ignore, you can, unless you have a dictionary on you. It says, uh, not the first, but the second one. Look up and define gossamer, tippet, and tool. I'll give you this. But you can do all the others. Uh, so you may begin. I got it right here. Let me give it to you. You can write this down. Uh, gossamer. Gossamer is something um, like a texture, like a fabric, uh, but it's something light and delicate. Light, it's, it would be a fabric that would be very light or delicate. That's gossamer. Uh, tippet is a long scarf. And tulle, T-U-L-L-E, T -U -L -L -E, um, it's like silk. Do any ladies ever heard that tool? My wife knew with that. What do you know about it? Um, from what I remember, tool is like it's kind of like a covering, like sort of thin layer of covering over top of the skirt. Oh, okay. Because it's 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 silky and it's um, it's you can see through. It has a 
sheer kind of sub, you can, you know, it's it, it's not opaque. So it would be over, I, said, I didn't know that. You're saying it would, it would go over some other fabric, right? Anyway, just keep that in mind as you read it. I might help you understand what she's trying to describe.
sure you answer both parts of the question because the second part is a follow up. And yeah, wait till somebody gets back to me. Sure, notice that question number one has three parts to it. Uh, question number three has two parts to it. Question number four has three parts to it. And question number six has two. So make sure that you're, you're, you're not answering the whole question if you only answer the first part. a scarf.
I mean, why describe death as a kind gentle? Maybe that's the better way to ask it. Why does she describe it as a kind gentle? How could death be kind? Yes. Well, it explicitly says that he kindly stopped for me. Right. Now, how, how, how do you explain that? How could death be something kind? You're right. Yeah. It can, it can take that away from the suffering. That would be a good example. Yeah. It, it finally, death has come. It's, I don't have to suffer like this. Um, so I, I don't know other other, other ways that might be, but it's one thing you can say. It's not what she expected. Death is not what she or I would expect. Um, Jameson, how about um, we did the number two? How about the theme of the poem? What does uh, it finally have to say about death and immortality? Um, I just think the theme of death. Like, well, what does it say about death? What do we learn about death? Um, I said that like death is slow and like it will come and it will go through the past. Like death is slow, but it will come. Um, and maybe what we said earlier that it comes unexpectedly. Um, here it says, I could not because I could not stop for death. He stopped for me. What? Maybe she's being sarcastic, but what does she mean? Because I could not stop for death. Oh gosh, I gotta, I gotta die. Gee, I was in the middle of this other thing. That's absurd. Um, so what does she mean by that? That's kind of way it's described, right? She was busy doing her thing, and all of a sudden death showed up, and she, oh, thank you for reminding me. I didn't, I couldn't remember. Well, what's the point of showing death like that? And maybe who has it said it's inevitable? Me. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing to say at this point, is that you cannot avoid it, that no matter what your life is like, good or bad, um, it's going to come on his, maybe on his schedule, not yours. It's not going to ask yours, are you ready? I'll come back next week if you want me to. You, yeah, sure, take a, take a couple more years. And it's it's going to come on his schedule. Um, it doesn't matter what you're up, up to. Uh, ben, no, you can Ben. I'm glad you do you do. Um, oh, what does it say about immortality? There are the, you can't go to immortality until you die. So what is it that death is surprising? Seems like immortality was all close. What's the only thing that really surprised her? What surprised her about immortality? Why did that surprise her? She says, um, since then, the day she died, his centuries and yet still shorter than the day I first surmised the horse his head were toward eternity. What what's what did she say about that? What she said, we'll finish with this, yeah. I think it's saying like centuries are passing and like time just keeps going on like a day and like But she says uh, that didn't seem as long as the, the moment she realized that this was immortality or this is eternity. Well, I wonder what is she saying about eternity? Have you, have you wondered how long eternity is lately? Have you ever gone there? Have you ever tried to think, how, how long is forever? Does it not blow your mind if you've ever thought of those thoughts? You're not capable of understanding something that never ends. Maybe she's saying something like that. Anyway, we'll come back to this. Um, I'll see you tomorrow, but on Friday, if yeah, for some reason we weren't here Friday because of the weather, just plan on Monday. If you're going to be ready for Friday, we need the book. So just make sure that you're ready Monday for what we might do on Friday. All right, we'll see you.